Hello, and welcome to the second module in our series about dementia and aging with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Today's topic is presented by Dr. Julie Moran. We will also hear a caregiver story. Dr. Moran is a geriatrician and specialist in aging and intellectual and developmental disabilities. She consults with Tewkesbury Hospital as well as the Massachusetts Department of Developmental Services. Dr. Moran is also a clinical instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Today's topic is early evaluation of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. What I'd like to do in the next segment is talk you through a framework of how to assess change um, that might be related to memory specifically and also to keep in mind many other possibilities that often masquerade as memory loss or forgetfulness. There are some barriers to the recognition of early Alzheimer's disease though and that that is due to the fact that early changes can be quite subtle or atypical and that the assessment for this is highly caregiver and pri provider dependent and this gets back to the idea of history and who's able to really clearly know that individual throughout their lifetime so that they can observe the early changes the more subtle changes that come with the early emergence of dementia so if the informant who's observing the patient is a family member or an, a, a well-established group home manager versus a newly hired support staff, you're going to get a different variety of impressions about what is being observed. It's going to take an astute observer and somebody who knows the individual well to say, boy, they never needed help doing that specific task before, and now I'm noticing they're looking a little bit more lost. Um, the other barrier is that individuals with early changes who have intellectual disability are less likely typically to self-report any changes. Um, they're not going to be your um, MIT professor with two PhDs who's going to say, I'm, I'm not able to do, you know, a complex um, recipe by memory anymore. It's going to be somebody who's um, starting to show some very subtle changes that really is dependent on an observer to report. So early identification helps us to find other treatable or improvable conditions that might be leading to these changes. This could include uh, mood disorder, depression, low thyroid, for example. And by bringing uh, early changes to the attention of a healthcare provider allows for a more thoughtful and thorough explanation to concerned caregivers. It stimulates a discussion then about future, setting realistic expectations, providing adequate support, and appropriate workshop and day program accommodations if the diagnosis is ultimately made. And also leads to initiation ideally of appropriate psychiatric treatment if there is a um, another psychiatric condition that needs attention such as depressed mood that is either untreated or undertreated. Uh, early consideration of anti-dementia medications and introduction of psychotherapy or other supports or counselors uh, to help support the individual throughout changes and provides opportunity for caregiver support, education, and anticipatory guidance for the future. So for adults with Down syndrome, we want to think about screening individuals starting at around age 40. That's looking for any changes specific to um, memory or function or change over time, and also thinking about uh, creating a baseline, so describing in detail and assessing in detail uh, what the individual is capable of so that we can be more astute observers for change as they grow older. This gets back to the concept that was discussed earlier in this talk about point A and point B. So when we think about dementia assessments, it really comes down to this particular framework about understanding change and understanding how things have transformed from point A to point B, what components have changed, and what has perhaps led to that change, what is contributing to that. And she moved into a group home with six women. Um, but she did stay there for about a year and a half and she continued to get more and more confused, continued to get more uh, distressed, um, unhappy. Uh, she really didn't know where she was. 
Making the diagnosis of dementia is a diagnosis of both inclusion and exclusion. So as I've said before, you want to make sure that you are convincing yourself that this is this seems to be suggestive of a dementia, that there are enough criteria that seem highly suggestive of the onset of a dementia, and that you have appropriately ruled out other possible coexisting conditions that could be contributing to the changes that have been observed. So you want to identify whatever coexisting conditions are there and endeavor to treat or improve all as you possibly can. And that would include um, any multitude of coexisting conditions that adults with Down syndrome are at higher risk for. So if you think back to the list that we described earlier, low thyroid, sensory deficits, early menopause, atlantoaxial instability and other changes with cervical spine, sleep apnea, arthritis and the pain that is accompanied that, decrease in functional ability, osteoporosis and celiac disease. If you think about the symptoms that are associated with all of these conditions, many of them can show up in ways that will uh, look like confusion or some sort of inattention or a slowing down or a loss in function. So thinking at least of these common culprits and making sure that we are uh, looking for any symptoms suggestive of that, screening for them as appropriate, and then looking deeper for other potential causes specific to the individual is an important and really crucial step in moving towards or away from a diagnosis of dementia. You want to always think about the overshadowing features of a new or worsening psychiatric illness. So if somebody has uh, depression that has become um, even uh, worse over time or if there's been other factors that are impacting that such as grief or other losses or if the person has developed their uh, their first depressive episode these are really important factors to keep in mind when making an assessment regarding uh, what's being interpreted as memory or cognitive changes and making sure we are not missing a potentially treatable um, a mental health or psychiatric diagnosis you want to also review all the other supporting information. So make sure that there has been recent blood work looking for other abnormalities that are common for people uh, that could contribute to mental status changes. This would be something to discuss with your primary care doctor. Keep careful records to make sure you're following performance over time. And this relates to just thinking about um, baseline abilities and keeping some sort of a a history of what the individual is capable of, what things would be typical for that person, so that any subsequent caregiver has a better and richer description of what that individual has been like throughout their lifetime, and they can be better observers for any change from that. And when I see people for this assessment in the office setting, I frequently do not give a diagnosis at the first visit because I think there is plenty of homework usually to do to look for a lot of other coexisting conditions so that we can do some work to look for how which factors are treatable or modifiable or what next steps need to be looked into before we rush ahead to a diagnosis. Uh, as some of you might have experienced, dementia is a sticky diagnosis and it's often something that is um, once it's uh, given to the individual has a way of then suddenly being the explanation for any change that anybody observes from that point forward. So you want to make sure you're being really careful about giving that diagnosis and making sure you've done due diligence to rule out other potential underlying causes. Thank you Dr. Moran and thank you for listening. This training module is one in a series of webinars about general aging with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Additional webinars appear on your screen. For additional resources on aging with intellectual and developmental disabilities and to access the webinars that were previously recorded, please visit either the Massachusetts Department of Developmental Services or the Center for Developmental Disabilities Evaluation and Research websites on aging with IDD. Thank you for listening.